Hi, and welcome back to the panel room. Tonight, we are here to storm the castles with four fabulous authors and me. So tonight, <laughs> before we get started, uh, I am your host, Jim Nettles, but let's go around the room and see who is here to join me. Jeannie, we'll go with you first. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's always fun to be first. I'm Jeannie Adams. I write uh, Paranormal Romantic Suspense, Romantic Suspense, Space Adventure with my friend Nancy Northcott, and we also do a series set in a castle on the Welsh Marches called Welcome to Canem Castle, or Christmas at Canem, and Christmas at Canem Castle, and Ring in the New at Canem Castle, and what's the trick or treat at Canem Castle? <laughs> so hey, castles, castles, Terry. Hi, Terry Brisbane. Uh, historical and paranormal and fantasy romance. Um, love castles. I think I've pretty much written castle in every book I've written. Um, just turned in, uh, so I'm a little bleary eyed. My fifty fourth book to my editor at six a.m. yesterday morning. So, here to talk castles. Let's storm. And time to start working on number fifty five as soon as we get done. <laughs> Always. Amy, how are you this evening? I am doing just fine. Um, how can I introduce myself? I usually just say I write speculative fiction because I can't really decide what my genre is. But I write <laughs> science fiction, space opera, fantasy, uh, what I call um, alternate mystery, which is my own little pet genre. But my real favorite is historical fantasy and Boy, do I love castles. I spent my 401k visiting castles, so I have neat pictures to show for it. And Nancy. I'm Nancy Northcott. I write historical fantasy for Falstaff Books, and the book on the screen with me is the first in a trilogy with a Richard III theme, and the castle behind me is Middleham, which was the home of Richard Duke of Gloucester, the future Richard III, during the time he headed the Council of the North for his brother, Edward IV, just wanted to put in that plug for Richard there. I also write <laughs> space uh, science fiction adventure with Jeannie and uh, several different subgenres of romance. So let's start with the fun question here, because everybody's here to talk about these nice big brick buildings. Um, what what is it about castles that that both you you know you personally love because you don't write about them unless you do? Um, but number two, what is it about castles for you and story and storytelling and, and the tales you're telling? So, Jeannie, we'll start with you on that one. Well, they're stone, James. They're stone, not brick. Stone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what's not to love? I mean, they're, they're mysterious. They're, you know, battlegrounds. They're <laughs> cauldrons of conflict. They're, they're just awesome. Plus, you know, hidey holes and secret passages and you know, built again, again, and again over the centuries and until no one knows what's really under the crypt. And, you know, lots of, lots of room for storytelling and plot bunnies there. So what's not D&D campaigns. Um, so nice Terry, <laughs> I'll let you, Terry. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to pick up on the cauldrons of conflict. I like that, Jeannie. <laughs> um, I, I, for all those reasons, the historical part as well. Um, when I'm setting and framing certain stories, they need to be about nobles and royals, and that means castles. Um, and it does give you a lot of opportunity uh, for um, storytelling. And you can kind of, and as Jeannie said, with romance, we need alcoves. We need hidden staircases. We need balconies. So to me, they just, it's perfect. It's just perfect. I think we just found a new anthology. Oh, and I, I, I did want to mention, because Nancy mentioned it, the castle behind me now is Dunstaffnage, which is on the, the west coast of, of Scotland. And I actually used it in my very first time travel story. That archway travels through time. You can go through time through that archway. So Excellent. I, I must go visit. I, if I disappear, you'll know what happened. Sorry. <laughs> Amy, what about you? Oh, well, I love Castle since forever, basically. But I think my first real reading experience with them was Howard Pyle's Men of Iron, which is still one of my favorite books ever. And um, I feature several castles in a my accursed Scottish novel, I like to call, call it, because it's going on 20 years and 
writing it, not quite 20. Um, but the castle behind me is Urquhart Castle. It is east of Drumna Drocket on um, Loch, Ness. Loch Ness. And it's featured in my story, which will, my novel, which will hopefully be published one day if I will quit revising it. <laughs> I was going to say, I be- that looks a lot like the famed castle on Loch Ness where you occasionally see the big fish. That, that's probably it because that's they always put Urquhart because there's this really nice big pool there right in front of it very very deep and uh, they usually put Urquhart on it there's several more buildings that you can't see uh, at what they call the water gate um, because it basically was almost like a walled village rather than just a single castle it had about I think there's about five major buildings within it so how about you Nancy um, I got enamored of castles <laughs> very young, and I think it was possibly at the same time I got interested in historical romance, and I saw what I now realize was a highly fictionalized account of the romance of Charles Brandon and Henry VIII's sister, Mary Tudor, not his daughter, his sister, called When Knighthood Was in Flower, and then I got older. And I started actually reading history. And I realized that to borrow a phrase from Camelot, knights were always not, not always about might for right. Sometimes it was about might for me. But <laughs> by that time, I was already in love with the whole knights and castles and the whole thing like that. And I learned not long ago, picking up on what Amy was saying about Urquhart Castle, is to, um, on the opposite side from the book cover, is a road. And at one point, there was a whole bailey next to the castle in the area where that road and the stable that sits on the other side of the road from the castle now are. And all that's gone. And interestingly, many of the buildings in the town are made of stone that matches the stone of the castle really well. As I recall, Middleham has that same problem, right? Well, I'm talking Middleham, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so for, for everybody out there, I mean, everybody's picture of a castle tends to be a little bit different. I mean, you know, we, we've seen whether it is the, the fairy princess type of a castle, um, whether you're talking something that's more like the borderland forts. Let's talk a little bit about what does a castle mean for you? How, you know, the kind of castles you like to work into your writing, you know, how are you really actually defining the nice big rock building? So Terry, we'll start with you on this one. Well, to me, a castle is um, a bigger structure. It's an encompassing structure. So there's always a keep. I always have stables. There's always a wall. Um, I, Other than Dunstaff Nodge, I haven't really used real castles as a specific site. So I tend to just keep it that simple. I have outbuildings. I have, you know, and mine certainly doesn't look fairy tale because it's middle age, medieval Scotland, and it's kind of rough and ready. Um, And none of my stories include like, um, well, there's a royal castles, but that's not, those aren't the main locations for the story. So they generally include more, you know, not hill and mott, but but they, you know, a keep and some walls and yeah, that's what I use. How about you, Amy? And you're on mute. I keep coughing. So I had to switch. Uh, I've got three castles in my uh, novel. One is Urquhart. Uh, the other is Talat Castle, which is in Dingwall. And then there's a castle that no longer exists, which was Dingwall Castle, that the Stuarts finally got tired of everybody rebelling out of that castle and basically <laughs> blew it to smithereens. But it has the same <laughs> issue with Nancy's castle, that you can still see parts of the castle in the town of Dingwall, including a very large house that was built with a stone that they reused from the castle. So um, I was really fortunate. I found a contemporary description of the interior of the castle and actually what was served at a feast during the time of um, James IV. So um, that was very, very helpful. And the rest was totally my imagination. But the other castle, Tallet Castle, which is on the side of the hill in Dingwall, um, it's very much more like the castles that Terry is describing. So one building, basically the keep. Um, none of the Scottish castles have moats with water on them, although it's a moat in Bailey, but it's M-O-T-E, and it doesn't, doesn't mean that. Um, 
and Talek was up on the side of the hill and it was totally and completely dependent on its walls for protection. And that castle, like some of Terry's castles are very, it was very old. It was first built in the, in the main part in the 12th century um, was the dungeon was, was all that's left of it. But I was fortunate because they turned Talek into a hotel. If you have plenty of money one summer, go to Talek Castle in Dingwall, Scotland, and you can stay there. It is haunted. I saw a ghost, which is really cool to have ghosts in your castle. And um, But sitting in the dungeon and riding for about an hour was absolutely creepy. Creepy, 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 because there was probably 40 dead ghosts, you know, in there. And it was just... Plus, stone walls are just freezing cold. <laughs> you have to be, yes. you know, it doesn't matter what time of year. It is so cold in a dungeon. So um, I just love them. There's just such uh, atmosphere in them. And my and in my particular story, someone is going from lord to lord trying to get a resolution of a family problem. And so they have to visit every castle. So these three castles are involved in my story. And actually, there's a fourth castle. But like... Um, like Dinglaw Castle, it's long gone and stored away on the Isle of Lewis. So I've got four castles in my book. Probably why I can't finish the bloody thing. But. <laughs> well, and if you're having to argue with all the different ghosts as to whose story you're going to tell, I mean, that, this is true. How about you, Nancy? I like the castles. I think of them as Anglo Norman castles. The towers are flat. And they have crenellations around the edges and along the walls. Now, for anybody who's not familiar with the term, the crenellation is the up and down pattern on the battlements because you can hide behind that and shoot arrows out at people across the ditch or if you happen to have a moat uh, across the moat. I like that. kind. Some of the ones in Europe have um, round pointy roofs on the tops of the towers. And I think it's as simple as that wasn't what a, was in the storybooks I read when, in elementary school. So to me, that's not a castle. Um, a lot of the castles in the Highlands have really steep roofs on the halls, and I'm sure it's to shed snow. But there again, my preconceptions were formed when I was very, very young. And um, Ludlow Castle, which was mm -hmm. a lot of the inspiration for Canem Castle in the series that Jeannie was talking about earlier, is that kind of castle with the flat towers and the crenellations on the walls. And just as a little note of trivia, you had to get permission from the crown to crenellate. You couldn't just build your wall with those defenses. You had to get permission from the crown. Now, they didn't come along two generations later and say, excuse me, you got to knock down those things that your grandpa put <laughs> on that roof. I mean, once you had them, you had them. But um, that to me, is a typical castle. It's it's what comes into my head when somebody says castle. How about you, Jeannie? Yeah, I'm I'm sort of like the others. I don't tend to think of like Nguyen Schwan when I think of castles. I tend to think more of the, uh, and for those who don't know, Nguyen Schwan is in Germany. It has all the spires and pointy roofs. Is very much more like the Disney Cinderella castle. Uh, I tend to think more about the, the Anglo-Norman. I like that. Uh, I'm probably most fond of Pickering, but <laughs> that's because that's my family surname. <laughs> uh, my, my absolute favorite, really, honestly, is probably Edinburgh Castle uh, because I get a chance to visit it frequently. Thanks to my friends giving me a, a Scot Scotland National Scottish Historical Society thing so I can go in there anytime I want, which is awesome. You're and, killing me. Uh, You're killing me. Uh, it's so great. <laughs> The hard part uh, is having to pry I you out, we know. <laughs> one I feel like I absolutely have to see while I'm here uh, in Scotland, though, is uh, Jedburgh Abbey, which is built as a fortified, uh, um, it's crenellated, it's fortified, it's a hill, it's basically, it's not a hill fort because it's not that old, but it's basically a fortified manor. And uh, so that's one on, that's absolutely on my list. And Lawrenston Castle here in the city, here in Edinburgh, is, uh, but it's more late. It's really much, much later, and it's much more of a country home kind of castle than it is. And at my university, we have a single tower remaining of a fortified uh, castle, but it's from the 1300s and, you know, sort of in the middle of Edinburgh. So it wasn't really a battlement per se. Uh, 
but like Nancy said, I sort of sort of think of and like the traditional kind of crenellated tops and fortified walls that are like six feet thick. And so, yeah. Does that answer the question, James? <laughs> oh, sure, we'll go with that. I mean, and, 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 Found it good. <laughs> and mentioning having that kind of a tower at your university in Scotland, where you currently are, you know, that does feed into the idea of having to have somewhere to send the troublesome students. Um, yes, yes. We make them stand on the tower top in freezing rain. It's, it's incentive not to misbehave. And yet you keep winding up being, oh, sorry. So let's actually dive a little bit deeper. You know, if, if somebody wanted to come in and start writing, whether it's a romance, whether it's an adventure, something like that, and you're starting to work with a castle and using a castle as, as a primary setting, you know, how do you go about the work between it's just a castle and it, it gives you a frame versus, you know, the castle is much more almost a character. It's, it's so much of the world building. It's a, it's a critical part of the story to be in a castle and that kind of a building versus just the, oh, uh, that'll sound like a cool spot to be, you know, how, where's that line for you? How does that, how does that work for you in a story? So Amy, we'll start with you on that one. Well, um, like I said, I've written some other things that have castles in them, but the story that I've been working on for so long, uh, the main protagonist is um, um, a German Jew and he's never been around castles very much. He's from a city called Worms. It's uh, most famous because I think it's the place where Martin Luther nailed up the 99 theses, but I'm not 100% sure. It's one of those cities that starts with a W. But um, he's really not been around castles. And because he's having to do a, a petition that's a commercial but a family thing, he's going to these castles. And so since I'm able to tell it, from the viewpoint of somebody who's never been around, especially an old Scottish castle, he is indeed a stranger in a strange land. I'm actually able to get some description in without going too overboard. And um, he has a lot of trouble with his dietary restrictions when they serve things. And uh, so that's kind of been an issue for him in my story. And so I, I've had a lot of fun with it, but because I used an outsider I was able to describe the castles, I think, a little bit more and get away with it. How about you, Nancy? Well, I actually, in all the books that I have in print, do not have an actual castle, except in the Canon well, Castle stories. I was going to say. <laughs> because the uh, historical fantasy trilogy starts in 1674, and castles had fallen out of use, and I'll spare you the whole thing about the English Civil War and sliding castles and all that. But um, that was more the era of manor houses. Um, but I think if in the stories that I have written with castles, I think when you design the castle, um, there are some things that you have to have. You have to have a gateway and a ditch with some kind of bridge over the ditch. You can have a ditch or you can have a moat, but you would never build a castle without something, some obstacle to get that invaders would have to cross to get to the walls or like a modern Bailey castle, you're way up on top of a hill and they got to climb the hill. But for a larger castle, you got to have a gateway. You got to have a hall because that's where the household ate. Got to have stables because that's where you keep the horses. And then you might have all kinds of other support buildings. Like you might have um, a Fletcher's, hut where a Fletcher's the person who puts the feathers on the arrows. You might have a blacksmith. Um, it just depends on what your particular castle has. And so when you're looking at an imaginary castle, you would go by what you need for your story beyond those basics. Like I have a muniments room in, um, actually there is a castle. I take that back. It's more of a fortified manor in the Herald of Day, not crenellated, but there's a muniments room where an muniments room is where you keep important documents. And so it does feature in that particular book. So you just kind of have to decide what you want. And one of the things I was surprised by when I visited Middleham after wanting to go there for years and years and years is that when you go into the courtyard, you cross the bridge that was not the original entrance. The original entrance was on the side next to the road. And you came through that other bailey, which is castle for courtyard with lots of support buildings in it. Um, but you, when you come in the existing gateway, 
the space between the keep and where the curtain wall, which is the term for an outside wall, for those of you who are not familiar with it, was not very much. And I was thinking, how can you ride a horse in here and like take a horse around to stables? And how do you, how does, you know, the, the curse of writers is how does that work? How do my characters do this? What are they looking at when they do this? And so, so we really, all have live heavy, heavy books and libraries because we're yeah. like, how does it work? I have to know how that works. Yeah. Yes. Which is why getting a book on castles and fortifications is a really good place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I found out about this whole other courtyard that has completely disappeared and how a lot of the support functions of the castle were in that courtyard. And the whole thing made a whole lot more sense to me because you wouldn't have as much heavy traffic in that area as you would have otherwise. And then um, Jeannie will talk more about this because she's the one who did all the drawings. But when we were creating Canaan Castle, um, Ludlow, I went to Ludlow in part because it has walls and ceilings. I mean, the walls are mostly intact, not completely. There are floors put in, in places. You can climb up in the towers. You can feel what it's like to look out the windows. But then we started having people add on to it for how they wanted to do their stories, what they needed in their stories. And Jeannie had a real job because I would go, but, but it's not, it's not. And she would go, Nancy, this is an imaginary castle. We have to remember this castle is imaginary. We are putting in it what we need. So, um, so you do. If not you're actually gonna, Ludlow. Yes, not actually. It's not actually Ludlow. We're making but, this up. Yes, we're making this up. Um, inspired and think, by a real castle, but. Well, and that really literally is true. It was inspired by a real castle, which has a huge um, outer courtyard. It's five acres. You could really assemble your troops in there if you're getting ready to march off somewhere. So we, we kept the big exterior external courtyard because the medieval Lord of the Manor might have wanted to march his army off somewhere. But um, it was adapted for the story. It's just that I kept forgetting what we were adapting versus <laughs> what I had seen walking the ground. And so um, it's... If you're collaborating a, about a castle, it really does help if you remember it's imaginary. <laughs> How about you, Jeannie? Uh, well, I had great heaps and piles of fun drawing the imaginary castle. Uh, and in the stories, um, Christmas at Canaan Castle is the first one. And in the stories, it is now a hotel. And uh, one of these, the one of the fancy hotels like uh, Amy was mentioning and um, <clears throat> but because it was a Welsh border fort, um, both what it was based on and what we have it as, uh, it is pretty heavily fortified. And so there is a, a, a ditch and there is a, an outer curtain wall with a portcullis gate and an inner curtain wall with a portcullis gate. <laughs> um, one of the things, though, I wanted to mention it to anybody who's thinking about putting a castle in a story is there's an absolutely amazing book by David McCauley, and it's just simply called Castles, and it's a children's book. Do you have it on your shelf? I was just it? looking. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's absolutely fabulous because like the Dorling Kindersley books, it, it lists you know, this is what this is, and this where this is what you did in here. This is what a muniments room does. This is this is the armory. This is the Fletcher's hut. It has all of those things, and then descriptions of what they do. And I think I first read that book, oh gosh, decades ago, and absolutely loved it. Was completely fascinated with it. And a lot of the a lot of the map drawing for Canem Castle comes from the fact that I loved that book and I love the Dorling Kinder, the DK books that show like levels and uh, ground plans and, and, you know, elevations and things like that. Plus, you know, wanted to be an architect. So I like drawing all that stuff. How about you, Terry? Well, I have to double down too again on the kids books. Um, what I usually do is when I am setting a story, deciding on the time period, then I kind of look to see what castles were around in the area. And luckily, you know, with the internet, you can find floor plans and pictures and reproductions. And so I kind of do that as a beginning um, 
to come up with an idea for the castle. I draw mine, but Jeannie, I am certain it is not to the level that yours are. <laughs> kind of imagine a kind of imagine a stick person castle instead of <laughs> but I I always, you know, as I'm going along in a story, suddenly I have them coming in from a different direction. Or so by drawing at least a basic layout, you know, of what I'm going to use. And uh, I I have to laugh about that. But I just worked on a collaboration. Um, Last summer, the year before that, with six authors, and we decided to have a um, a tournament set outside of the huge castle, and we chose Wales or the border of Wales and England because there were so many great castles in that area in those areas. So, but we did too. We had the drawing. Somebody had was very artistic and because I think I'm a visual learner for the most part, mm-hmm. and so I need to see it. I, I Same need here. To, yeah. yeah, and the other well, part is I. Oh, go ahead. Oh, plus you have to, if you've got six or seven authors, you can't have somebody put one thing in the North Tower, then somebody put something else in the North Tower that's completely incompatible with the first vision put in the North Tower. So you kind of have to agree on all that. That's right. And then I have been blessed to be able to go over to the UK and see a lot of the different types of castles and walking through them and looking out and seeing what they would be seeing and from different perspectives that's helped a lot but I know that's not always possible so um, I do go back to all of the kids books as well as the internet for a lot of texture to add I just want to pick up on something that Terry just said about looking out windows I love looking out windows Now, granted, I know that what I'm seeing beyond the window is not what the people who lived in this castle saw. The landscape around it has changed a lot. But if you stand at a window and you use a little imagination, like if the castle overlooks a river, like Barnard Castle does, well, the river was still there when the castle was an administrative center. And so you can imagine what else is out it. And so I really do recommend if you are able to go visit a castle, look out a window. There's a window at Middleham that people are always posting pictures of on social media because they stop and they look out that one window. It's the only window that the frame is intact and you can, it's on the stairs and you can stand there and look out the window and it turns up on social media on a fairly regular basis. There's something about windows. Well, I'm going to pick up on that too, because Nancy and I went to Middleham and actually standing up on one of those tower tops is a a whole different experience than what you, I mean, yes, you can imagine it. And yes, your imagination is good, but I never really truly understood just how far you can see from one of those tower tops. And I thought, well, you know, maybe that was just, you know, a thing with Midland. And then I was in the castle here in Edinburgh and I was like, nope, it's a castle thing. (laughs) And even, even knowing that the vista is not the same, the river, like you said, Nancy, the river would be the same. There are certain things like Edinburgh Castle, you're going to look at and you're going to see Arthur's seat. That's still going to be there. You can see the Fourth of Firth. But uh, looking out and seeing the landscape, even knowing that a lot of that has changed, you still get a sense of just how difficult it would be to attack one of these things yeah. successfully. I had something about the landscape issue. <clears throat> when I was at um, Talat Castle and looking out from Dingwall, Dingwall is down low on um, it's near the Black Isle, and I'm trying to, and it's the Moray Firth, and then the Cromarty Firth comes off the Moray Firth into where Dingwall is and where the Black Isle is. But anyway, when I was comparing some things about traveling because they were both owned by the Lord of the Isles at one time. And my story set place in 1475 and looking from where Dingwall castle used to be to where Talat castle still is. I was having trouble with the river and I couldn't understand because some early descriptions had you looking at certain places at the river and a bridge over the river being somewhere. And I just couldn't quite, make that work with my actual experience of going there. And these crafty old Scots, like in the 19th century, moved the bloody river. So you can't <laughs> trust them. <laughs> they will move, they will move natural resources around if it's more <laughs> convenient. And they actually did that. And they also 
There was an island in the middle of the river at one time where they used to have the thing, which is trans can becomes Dingwall, North. where they had the legislation of the Norsemen, where they would meet and make their laws and judge and all. And that island is gone because I looked everywhere for this bloody island no 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 the island went away when they moved the river so i'm like damn it that's a bit much don't you think just conveniently moving a river but they did well didn't the scots produce a lot of engineers oh yes yes, yes they did <laughs> i'd like Apparently to you something. need engineers if you're going to move rivers so. <laughs> i'd like to add a children's book before i forget about it it's an oversized picture book and i'm going to mangle the author's name and i apologize to him because i've never said it out loud in front of people but his name is Stephen s-t-e-p-h-e-n and i think it's beisty b-i-e-s-t-y yes. that's the book we used <laughs> ah. I love that book. We got it when our yes. son was small because he was, what a shock, fascinated with castles. And so <laughs> it has cross sections of castles. You know, oh, you start at the front, book. you turn the page, you go into the next one. And um, we have another big picture book about castles. I forget exactly what it is, but I love that castle. And the detail in that, in the drawings is just mm -hmm. astonishing. It may be out of print now because children's books don't tend to stay in print. It's not out of print. Terry, you're shaking. Nope, not out of print. <laughs> awesome. No, I'm, look, look I'm looking at, at it on like Amazon that. as we I speak. was going to say, we bought, that was the book we all bought to use as the basis for our mutual castle. And that was last year or the year before last. Okay. And for anybody so. who, who would like to know, it's called Stephen Beistie's Cross Sections Castle. Thank you, Jeannie. So, Dick, Terry, Great. did you get print copies or did you get electronic copies? Print. I'm glad, I'm glad to know yes. that's still available because I really yeah. love that book. Um, yeah. So, in End of my shameless plug for Stephen Beisty. It's a good no, one. No, it's not shameless it's as long one. as it's not your book. Shameless That's plugs right. come later. So, <laughs> and if we look at it, castles, and so when you're writing a scene, when you're crafting the scene, whether it is the romantic interlude in the alcove, whether it is the you know the palace intrigue that goes along, you know, storm, getting ready to storm the castle or defend the castle. You know, all of these are part of the stories we see around a castle because that's part of the good thing of having the big stone building is, you know, it's it's hard to capture. Um, and it gives lots of little nooks and crannies in which to. How does that play into craft and the story for you? How is that different to tell that kind of a story in a castle than, say, in a modern setting or how is it different to set it in, you know, a village setting if you're writing historicals, you know, how, how different does it kind of make that relationship or the setting and in, in creating that environment? Because again, the idea of being surrounded with stone and the, a lot of the time, the cold, or if you're in certain places, the heat, because, you know, again, castles were built in a lot of other places other than just in, you know, the British Isles. I mean, look at a lot of the Mediterranean castles that are built surrounding, surrounding the Med. Look at some of the castles that were built here or throughout the islands by the Spanish in, in 1500s. We, it's, it's, very, it, it's a very strong feeling to be surrounded by all of that stone and all of the artwork and the idea and the engineering that went into it because all of it has a practicality to it as well as being the decorative nature of it. So how much does that work its way into the story is almost being a character into and of itself. Um, Cause every castle has a bit of its own personality. So Nancy, you know, how about you? Well, I think it needs to work its way into the story in terms of what these features mean to the characters. I'm on this panel cause castles really are my jam. And when I finally reached a point in my life where I could actually go and see them, I was beyond thrilled because that was out of reach for me when I was growing up. Our family just, we couldn't do that. So I really, really love castles. And I read a science fiction novel in which the protagonists were on an alien world and they were in, in a jungle or a forest and they were being chased by uh, natives of the planet and they took refuge in this castle and they're followed like a half a page of description of the castle 
And I got through that and I thought, I don't have a mental picture of this castle. I don't. And there's a phrase that, that seems to have fallen out of vogue in writing cl classes, which is active description. Don't just describe it. Tell us what it means. You know, if the passageway is 10 feet wide, what does that mean in terms of how many people you need to defend it? If the stairway spirals this way, does it spiral this way so a right-handed swordsman can defend it alone? You know, tell us stuff like that. Um, and I think it makes it more real for the character, for the reader, if the character says it's cold. You know, it, no matter what we do, no matter how many tapestries we hang, it's drafty in the winter. And then, then you don't have to say every third sentence how it's cold because you've kind of already said that. Um, and I do think it's important to describe it because it's not familiar. You know, if you say small town street, that an image pops into everybody's head of that because, well, most everybody, because most of us have been to a small town at one time or another. Castle, the image that pops into people's heads most of the time, I think, is kind of vague and it's big walls and towers and a gateway and stuff like that. And so if you want to make it more than that, like in Lord of the Rings, there's that scene where... Um, the orcs are trying to batter down the gate at Helm's Deep and Aragorn, Aragorn and Gimli go out what's actually known as a sally port. And that's where the phrase sally forth comes from. You go out the sally port with a relief party against the besiegers and Aragorn has to throw Gimli because the sally part is too far from the ramp to the gate for Gimli to jump it. And it's a nice little character bit because Gimli hates to be tossed. You know, earlier in the in the series, he goes, nobody tosses a dwarf. And then here we are at Helm's Deep and he's got to ask Aragorn to toss him. And I think that's purely based on the layout of Helm's Deep, which we didn't get into a lot of detail of, but we saw it in establishing shots, I think. So um, well, oh, we're and not I'll, I'll, running on. Huh? I'll mention this because, you know, a lot of time we see things in movie and film like Helm's Deep where you're looking at, well, that's a long way down, but you know, what castle would really be like that? And I mean, I think that people would be surprised at how big some of these walls are. Um, when I was at when, and one of the ones that was really surprising to me when we were in Havana, um, in Castle Mora, there is there is a part when you're going through the inside where it's probably a good hundred foot drop down into to the defensive position. Once you're already inside <laughs> and the idea that a lot of these alcoves and turns and the way that stairs were built and the amount of engineering that goes into these things, because again, if, you know, stairs were built to go the opposite direction. Well, the reason for that was that way you can defend them from the top. Um, you know, I, that's, I think is one of the things. So if you look at something like Lord of the Rings, two towers, you're getting this, this view of these huge, structures and like well who's going to build something that big in the real world i think that if you've never stood on one of these buildings you you don't get that impression until you've really yeah you don't you don't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it goes with churches too because they were fortified just in some ways especially the ones throughout france and uh belgium and luxembourg and things and germany too the church churches were fortified structures as well and you can get that same sense of permanence and massive walls and all that sort of thing but castles are a whole another order of magnitude and i think trying to make them part of the story like you were saying jim is almost imperative if you're going to use it because a lot of people like nancy said haven't had that experience of going and standing on a battlement or walking up those narrow stairs and I have really big feet. <laughs> Those narrow <laughs> stairs made me so crazy. I was so afraid I would fall because I, I literally could only put like the front part of my foot on the riser. And, you know, re realizing that standing in the gate of Pickering Castle, I would have probably had to duck. And I'm only 5'7". But you realize that now, of course, in a story, you're going to build it to to scale for what you need. And you're not going to mention that your hero is 5'7", <laughs> because it's medieval and that was tall. Uh, 
But I think making it part of the character is, is almost an imperative so that people can get the sense of it if they've never been. You give them that sense of it. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's part of the fun of the storytelling, too. Yeah. The, the other part I've run into or I deal with, too, is, you know, a castle is a city for all intents and purposes, mm-hmm. but it's also a home. And so in terms of relationship scenes, I very much utilize parts of the castle that would be for the family, for the more domestic kind of scenes, um, the kitchens, the um, the ladies chambers, the, you know, and so I, I, I do utilize a lot of, you know, small areas in a big castle for the scenes that I have, you know, the uh, romance kind of thing. But then you can also have the the whole castle to use for battles. And and, uh, so I do use it that way. It's not just the background. It plays very much into how I structure the scenes and where I set them. Um, I did want to mention, Nancy, I kind of shook my head when you said that about staircases for right-handed defense. Um, I was just at a talk, um, James Wright, who's an architectural archaeologist oh, wow. um, in England and studies old buildings and castles, just did a Mythbuster presentation. And that is one of his eight Mythbusters um, really? topics. And it turns out it has no basis in actual fact or in numbers, percentages at all. It was put into a guidebook somewhere and it has trickled down through <laughs> every mm-hmm. guidebook that the National Trust uses in of England course. and Scotland and Wales. And he said, basically, looking at the numbers, it just doesn't hold up. And I was shocked by that because that was something I believed. <laughs> well, there's uh, actually, but- there, uh, sorry to interrupt. There's actually an interesting counter study that was done to that where they did an experiment where they put knights in full armor and put them into the spirals to see what it was like to attack and defend. So they've actually put that to an experiment as well. I think it depends on which tower you're in. Because one of the things they showed was the narrower stairs, the ones that were narrower had an effect. The wider staircases that were more lived in, it was pretty much, they were wider to allow both sides to pass. Yeah, it was, I, I found it very interesting, but when he, he mentioned about different, you know, how the, the whole idea came about, he's done an entire lockdown series. Every week he was doing um, something about a different building and different, and now he's doing a monthly series of these Mythbusters. So we're going to talk about <laughs> reusing ship timbers is this month. So, um, but he, they're available. His blog is online, James Wright, and it's, uh, he's very interesting. Is that W-R-I-G-H-T and his company or his um, is called Triskelly Heritage. Um, Cool. And yeah, very uh, just amazing stuff. So I should check that out. How about you, Amy? Oh, I'm sorry, Nancy. Go ahead. No, I was I was just go ahead, Nancy. That's it. Oh, I wanted to mention that, you know, with Scottish castles, especially in the the far northern highlands, which were really very much influenced by the Vikings, who weren't just Vikings there. I mean, they came in, they conquered, they ruled them for a while, that for many years, um, the Hebridean islands were owned by the king of Norway, and they were gifted to the Scottish king when they married a North a Norse daughter, basically. And previous to that, they'd been part of the Scandinavian countries. There were several other islands. I know that that was true of. But things like you might expect an Obliette, a place of forgetting in a dungeon, in a more um, French-type castle. But um, what they had at Talek was a pit. It was 40 Mm -hmm. feet deep. And when they got tired of you and decided they weren't going to mess with you anymore, they just threw you down into the pit. And if you didn't die on the way down or at the bottom, you would die eventually because they weren't throwing any food or water down there. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was quite different. And then between Dingwall and Hallett Castle, there was a tunnel. That was one of my reasons to be so interested in where the river was. (laughs) because I I couldn't see them digging a tunnel under the river. And that's where the river was 
at the time I was there, but where the river used to be was obviously a little bit further east. I think it would be east. Anyway, um, but there was a tunnel between the two castles. And I don't know to this day if it was used mostly as an escape route from one to the other or if it was just to take servants from the, the castle up to what became a hunting castle for the Lord of the Isles because he owned both of them at the same time. I don't believe they weren't owned by the same people all the time. Mm-hmm. So even though there's lots of things that we can look at about castles and say these are similar and they have these things in most castles, if you're going to actually write about historic castles, those little suckers have differences. They're very yeah. individual and distinct. And everyone I saw was quite different. I, I love them. And I was only in the, I was only looking at castles in the Highlands. I've been to Edinburgh Castle, but I was there during the tattoo. And they won't let oh, you in the castle during the tattoo. My yeah, husband wanted to go. So, yeah. Well, there's but. actually a pitfall I'd like to bring up, which is, um, I think you can write a really good story set in a castle, looking at images online and getting books. I don't think it's necessary to walk the ground. It's a great perk, and obviously all of us love that, but it's not necessary. So if you're sitting there watching this and thinking, I want to write a castle story and I can't afford to go there, you don't have to go there. But the pitfall that I'd like to address is also don't do your research in movies, because yeah. when I was growing up, uh, the Camelot movie came out with Richard Harris and Vanessa Redgrave and Frank O'Nero. Wow, what a gorgeous great hall. Um, the, Ed- the Errol Flynn Robin Hood, one of my all-time ever favorite movies, gets shown almost every year on TV somewhere, and I do happen to own it. And the great <laughs> hall of Nottingham <laughs> Castle. Wow, it's big. <laughs> And then the Douglas Fairbanks Robin Hood, <laughs> it's in <enormous>. Nottingham <laughs> Castle. And so I sort of had this expectation that all Castle huge. Great Hall were huge. No. I finally was able to achieve the ambition of my entire adult life seven or eight years ago and go in Westminster Hall, which is the remnant of the palace, the medieval palace of Westminster. It's at the Houses of Parliament. And it was at the time, one of the biggest structures of its kind in Europe. And it's big, like those movie great halls are. Middleham Castle, not so much. Warwick Castle, not so much. And so you could put the entire great hall of Middleham Castle in roughly a quarter of Westminster Hall. And it's, you know, it it just wasn't ginormous like it was in the movies and I was talking to a friend who was a tour guide in the UK and he was saying talking about um, showing an American woman around because naturally it would be an American woman and she saw the castle and expressed shock that the Great Hall was not bigger and he was like well you know they they housed it held the household and this is the way it was and she went well why didn't they just make them bigger and it's like that really wasn't that simple <laughs> you have to defend it in order to defend it bigger. So um, I love. And there's movies. engineering and timberlings, yes. and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, so I love cost. those movies, but don't use their great halls because they're way too big. Just wanted. Yeah, to- and you've got to have proper foundations for those. When I was in Urquhart Castle, on the part that's identified as the Great Hall, I looked around and I went, "Oh my God, my parents' living room was this big." You know, that was built like in the 70s. And, you know, it was like 40 by 20 because it was kind of a spectacular house that they had for a short period of time. But I was luckily lucky enough to grow up and go to high school when we were living in that house. And I'm like, damn, I wish my dad was around to see this. He would be delighted that he basically had a great hall and didn't know it. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I find one of the pitfalls, Nancy, playing on what you just said is windows. Um, in true castles for defense, there were not big windows. You couldn't, you know, um, and I find that is when I see someone writing about all the windows and the glass windows in a castle, (laughs) 
it's like, yeah, no, it's another pitfall because we see it on the movies and we see it on, you know, um, and, and I, that's something I almost made that mistake. So I, yeah. and I hold it near and dear to my heart. <laughs> on the first floor of, of uh, talent castle, they didn't have any windows. They just had murder holes. That was right. it. You know, the nice little crosses so that you can conveniently shoot an murder. arrow at somebody. Yeah. 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 It was so See. funny because I always thought those must have religious significance. God was <laughs> I wrong? They did. You're going to go so- send somebody to meet their maker. <laughs> Basically, That's yeah. That's right. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about what what are the what is something else that you see that when somebody's writing a castle, just you're like, no, apparently they've never seen a castle outside of a Disney film. Um, you know, what's the one thing you look at and you're like, oh yeah, that's just not going to work. So Jeannie, I'm going to hit you up for that one first. Oh gosh. Um, well, I, I do kind of think that so many people write castles as having moats and a lot of them had ditches, but didn't have actual moats and the moats, uh, you know, they talk about the moats being really deep and that did happen in France and the French castles often did have very deep moats, but the English ones, they generally, from what I have read and Nancy and Terry and Amy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they were more ditches than, and if they happen to have water in them, great, but they weren't made as moats and people did not sail little boats on them. <laughs> Thanks for tell me they didn't have alligators. I was going to say, you're not really, alligator. you are breaking my heart here. <laughs> Well, and the other thing about moats, they weren't so pretty with little ducks and all swimming in them because they dumped waste into them. You know, human waste, moats were pretty nasty. So, yeah, there's well, a. You, want, you wanted it to be as filthy as possible to dissuade people from taking that bath. Oh, gross. Ugh. But there's this castle, it's Bodium or Bodium, I can't remember how to pronounce it, that is, it's not just has a moat, it's like on an island and you go across yeah. a causeway to get to it. And that's the only one I've ever seen that had a moat that had water in it. Now, apparently there used to be water around the tower of London in what's now the ditch, but there isn't any more. And um, there's this castle that I finally got to see. It's called Sandal Castle. It's in the town of Wakefield. It's a big Wars of the Roses castle. Richard III and Edward IV's father was killed at the Battle of Wakefield outside Sandal Castle. And it's got the steepest ditch I've ever seen. It's, it's really a deep, steep-sided ditch on both sides. And then the, the central mound where the castle sits is even higher. And so when I was there, it was considered to be unsafe and you couldn't cross the bridge to the island. So I didn't get to see that part. But I was looking it up recently online and they had so much rain in Wakefield that there was water in that ditch for the first time in centuries, they said. Unfortunately, I don't know whether it, that ditch was intended to be a moat because the castle is kind of even with the town on one side and then on the other side, the ground drops away sharply and you would see how it would dominate the skyline of the valley below. But I, now I need to know that and I don't know where to go to know it because there's not really a guidebook. The castle is managed by the county council and they have Brand new signboards, according to the article. And that's, you know, great. I'm glad they did that. I'm glad the middle part is open again. But I can't go there. So the signboards are not accessible to me at present. So I would like to know whether it was originally a moat or just a ditch. And now that's going to bother me till I figure it out. Well, you know, one of the things that really bothered me about Urquhart, I mean, it's built right on that little point going into Loch Ness. They could have had water in their moat. It wouldn't take taken, you know, these smart Scottish engineers could have figured it out. But did they put water in their moat? No, it's a ditch. You know, it's only a ditch. But there are, and up in the Hebrides, their, their Stornoway Castle originally was built on a small island. And then there's at least one other that I'm using as a model for Stornoway Castle that's built on another one of the islands, not Lewis the Isle of Lewis, the Isle of Lewis, the Isle of Harris are all one big island. Um, but it's on a very small island a little bit farther, uh, I guess, west and south from there. And I was going to study it some more and use it as my basis for Stornoway because there's nothing 
left that tells you about the old Stornoway Castle. It doesn't, it's under a dock right now. So there's no way to even go there and look at it. Handy place to keep it. Yeah, it got in the way. They built they built a ferry dock over it. So. Well, Fotheringay yeah. Castle, where um, Richard III was born, was kind of the family seat of the House of York. And it did have a moat from the river around it. Uh, it doesn't anymore. And all that's left, and there's like a metal fence around it, is this little lump of stonework. That's it. That's all that's left of the castle. I mean, you can climb the castle mound. There's no castle stuff up there. And by poking around on the internet, I found that when they dismantled the castle, they sold it. And these people in this nearby town took the stone and built an inn and a tea room with it. So now I have to go there. That's yeah. too much. Of course you do. Okay, I have to go there. <laughs> Ding, well, all that's left is one of the little tower turrets. And it's a folly in somebody's front yard, but it was actually... They removed it and put it over there. I don't know how they got it there. Now they had to rebuild it on the spot. (laughs) So we're coming up on time, but I do want to throw one more little question out there as a lightning round. And Nancy, I'm going to make you go last because this is going to make, you're going to just sit there and buzz like a bee until I let you answer it. So, (laughs) Flat your wings, Nancy. Very fast. So what's, what's the one kind of castle mystery? that you want to work into a story. The real historical mystery that from any castle that you want to pull into a story Mm. or maybe in some case have already done so, which is why Nancy has to go last. (laughs) (laughs) I want to go. All right, Amy, you're up. Uh, Sterling Castle. I can't remember if it was John Damien or one of the crazy wizards that they had over there. This He built some wings like Da Vinci and actually tried them out by jumping off the castle walls. And I so want to get that into something. And it didn't kill him. He apparently fell in some brambles. Uh, but I so want to get somebody trying out some wings and jumping off a castle wall. But I just can't figure out how to get it and my my story has a lot of urgency and it has a it has a ticking clock that they have to do so I can't get it in there. I was able to get him in there as a young man, but I couldn't get crazy jump off walls with wooden wings into my story. So that's why you need the madman's you know the madman alchemist. Yeah, it's just the comedy relief in the background going, oh God, what's he doing today? And has he gotten himself killed yet? <laughs> <laughs> that, that would have been me. Let's just let's just <laughs> buy that. So, Jeannie, how about you? Oh gosh, I just actually can't think of one. I think it's probably so late for me. My brain is on fry. Uh, I can't think of anything that I haven't already. Like I wanted to know what was under the dungeon, so I used that in Canem Castle. Ghost, ghost. Yeah, and of course. Oh, that's always something I would want to yeah. use as ghost. Yeah. Who may, who actually died there? That would be cool. Well, you did use a ghost. I know. I used ghosts as often as I can. <laughs> and also used the secret dungeon under the dungeon. Spirit of the story. There so, you go. Really? How about you, Terry? Um, well, the one that I really wanted to use, I actually have used in a fantasy series. It was um, Yester Castle, which is in... Um, kind of the eastern central Scotland, not far from Edinburgh. Um, and there's a hall that was built, the only part of the castle that remains, and it's called Hobgoblin Hall. And it was rumored to be built by a magician who was a counselor to Alexander III before he mysteriously fell off his horse and died, leaving Scotland without a king. And I just got such an inspiration from that, that I based him, he became the villain of my four book series. And um, so I want to go to Yester because I need to see what else is, you know, what else is hidden there? What else is, um, but I love the Hobgoblin Hall and, but I love the idea of hidden rooms. Um, There's one in Glam's Castle and I got a really strange reaction when I was, didn't realize I was standing in front of this sealed up room off of the great hall or off of the hall. And there are stories about it. And I really, that's something I would like to explore is what happened for real and who's behind that, who was, who ended up there. 
All right, Nancy. Well, uh, what Jim is ragging on me about is that <laughs> the thing that runs through the, the trilogy, the first book of which is next to me, the Boar King's Honor Trilogy, is named because Richard III used a white boar as his symbol. And the premise of the trilogy is that an ancestor of the Mannering family in 1483 unwittingly helped the Duke of Buckingham murder Edward IV's sons, Richard III's nephews, a.k.a. the princes in the tower. And so he realized that subsequent members of his family did not feel his great guilt over having sullied the king's name because Richard III was blamed. And when the Tudors killed him at Bosworth Field saying, oh, by the way, he was really a great guy could have gotten this wizard ancestor killed. And so he cursed his family line and the heirs can't rest in life or death until they clear the king's name. Um, so since then, and I'm going to save you all my soapbox because I do have a soapbox that I mount on this topic. I would just suggest <laughs> that I've come around to the belief that those boys did not die, that they were moved away for their safety. Um, and I suggest that everyone who has read only Shakespeare and believes only Shakespeare needs to get a grip and read <laughs> the survival of the princes in the tower by Matthew Lewis. And apparently I am like, you I'm are with you. I am with you on that. Yes. I, that, yeah, that's yes. an awesome book. And he really examines the different theories about the fates of those boys. And he never says, I think this is right. He says the things in favor of this or this, the things weighing against this or that. And he lets you make up your own mind. So, um, but if all you have ever been exposed to Shakespeare is don't even talk to me, don't at me as the saying goes, <laughs> go read that book. That's all I got to say. That's why Jim made me go last because he knew I would get started and it's hard to shut me up. So I'm shutting up now. You can stop flapping your wings now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for coming and hanging out with us for a, a good long while this evening to talk about, you know, fishing in the castle moats. Um, but before we get out of here, I'm going to ask everybody, let everybody know where we can find you, social media, websites, what's that next release that's coming out, all that kind of good stuff. So, uh, Jeannie, how about you? Well, you can find me at genieadams.com. You can find me on social media at Jeannie Adams for the most part. And usually I'm on the hive of scum and villainy that is Twitter. Uh, I spend a lot, way too much time there. And, but you can find me on Instagram and Pinterest and all that um, just under my name. And you can also find me here on continual a whole lot. Terry, how about you? Um, yeah, I'm on, on my website is terrybrisbane.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on, you can find those links on my, my homepage at, at terrybrisbane.com. Amy? What else was that it? Oh, well, <laughs> no, your newest media, release, yeah. which is right there over your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, and yeah. I have There's... a I have a new release coming out. I think it, it's out in England, but it's not here. But the Highlander Substitute Wife, which is the beginning of a Highland Alliances um, new three book mini series. Thank you, <laughs> Amy. I should mention that I write under a pen name. <laughs> That Amy Herring is Amy Louise Herring is my real name. My pen name is Louise Herring Dash Jones. I maintain haphazardly a web page at LouiseHerringJones.com. I stay off of Facebook until I finish the Accursed Scottish novel, except I post bird drawings once a month, whether I need to or not. And um, But I am starting to go back to conventions. I was just at Chattacon. I think I was on five panels in Chattanooga. The next one after that is Liberty Con, also in Chattanooga. I'm supposed to go to Jordan Con, but they said I don't have any panels. But they said that last year, and I had panels. I just found out after I got there. So I don't know for sure. And then I'll be at Contraflow in New Orleans and I'll be back at World Fantasy Con also in New Orleans this year. So, um, and with any luck, Dragon Con, but I work Dragon Con, so you won't be able to find me. Unless you want to be interviewed, and then I want to talk to you. So, <laughs> Well, we'll have to arrange that at Dragon. Uh, Nancy? You can find me at nancynorthcott.com. I'm on Twitter at Nancy Northcott. And like Jeannie, I spend more time there than is probably good for me. I have a Facebook author page that I'm 
after neglecting it for some time, trying to get back into shape. And I discovered that Facebook completely changed how that page worked while I wasn't paying attention. So I'm trying to figure that out. I am on Instagram, but I didn't do it right. So you can't find me by putting, you have to search Nancy Northcott, but I'm on there and there's some castle pictures on there. And, um, surprise. Yeah. Surprise. Yeah, surprise. Castles. <laughs> My last novel release was the second volume of the Boar King's Honor Trilogy, The Steel Rose, which is set in the 100 days between Napoleon's escape from Elba and the Battle of Waterloo. And the concluding it's so volume, good. Thank you. The <laughs> concluding volume, the King's, thank you. W the King's Champion is the concluding volume. It'll be out this year, and it starts at the Dunkirk evacuation and ends during the Blitz. And I'm Jim Nettles. You can find me at jamesbnettles.com, authoressentials.net, um, speculativefictionacademy.com and of course here at Continual when they turn me loose and let me out of the cage so <laughs> other than that I want to thank everybody for coming and hanging out with us this evening and we will see everybody again soon thank Bye. you good night